The Horror at Chilton Castle I had decided to spend a leisurely summer in Europe, concentrating, if at all, on genealogical research. I went first to Ireland, journeying to Kilkenny, where I unearthed a mine of legend and authentic lore concerning my remote Irish ancestors, the O'Brenans, chiefs of Uadach in the ancient kingdom of Ossory. The Brennans, as the name was later spelled, lost their estates in the British confiscation under Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Strafford. The thieving Earl, I am happy to report, was subsequently beheaded in the Tower. From Kilkenny I travelled to London, and then to Chesterfield in search of maternal ancestors, the Holborns, Wilkerson's, Searles, etc. Incomplete and fragmentary records left many great gaps, but my efforts were moderately successful, and at length I decided to go further north and visit the vicinity of Chilton Castle, seat of Robert Chilton Payne, the twelfth Earl of Chilton. My relationship to the Chilton Paynes was a most distant one, and yet there existed a tenuous thread of past connection, and I thought it would amuse me to glimpse the castle. Arriving in Wexwald, the tiny village near the castle, late in the afternoon, I engaged a room at the inn of the Red Goose, the only one there was, unpacked, and went down for a simple meal consisting of a small loaf, cheese, and ale. By the time I finished this stark and yet satisfying repast, darkness had set in, and with it came wind and rain. I resigned myself to an evening at the inn. There was ale enough, and I was in no hurry to go anywhere. After writing a few letters, I went down and ordered a pint of ale. The tap room was almost deserted. The bartender, a stout gentleman who seemed forever on the point of falling asleep, was pleasant but taciturn, and at length I fell to musing on the strange and frightening legend of Chilton Castle. There were variations of the legend, and without doubt the original tale had been embroidered down through the centuries. But the essential outline of the story concerned a secret room somewhere in the castle. It was said that this room contained a terrifying spectacle, which the Chilton Paynes were obliged to keep hidden from the world. Only three persons were ever permitted to enter the room, the presiding Earl of Chilton, the Earl's male heir, and one other person designated by the Earl. Ordinarily, this person was the factor of Chilton Castle. The room was entered only once in a generation. Within three days after the male heir came of age, he was conducted to the secret room by the Earl and the factor. The room was then sealed, and never opened again until the heir conducted his own son to the grisly chamber. According to the legend, the heir was never the same person again after entering the room. Invariably, he would become somber and withdrawn. His countenance would acquire a brooding, apprehensive expression, which nothing could long dispel. One of the earlier earls of Chilton had gone completely mad and hurled himself from the turrets of the castle. Speculation about the contents of the secret room had continued for centuries. One version of the tale described the panic-stricken flight of the Gowers, with armed enemies hot on their flagging heels. Although there had been bad blood between the Chilton Paynes and the Gowers, in their desperation the Gowers begged for refuge at Chilton Castle. The Earl gave them entry, conducted them to a hidden room, and left with a promise that they would be shielded from their pursuers. The Earl kept his promise. The Gowers' enemies were turned away from the castle, their murderous plans unconsummated. The Earl, however, simply left the Gowers in the locked room to starve to death. The chamber was not opened until thirty years later when the Earl's son finally broke the seal. A fearful sight met his eyes. The Gowers had starved to death slowly, and, at the last, judging by the appearance of the mingled skeletons, had turned to cannibalism. Another version of the legend indicated that the secret room had been used by medieval earls as a torture chamber. It was said that the ingenious instruments of pain were yet in the room, and that these lethal apparatuses still clutched the pitiful remains of their final victims, twisted fearfully in their last agonies. A third person mentioned one of the female ancestors of the Chilton Paynes, Lady Susan Glanville, who had reputedly made a pact with the devil. She had been condemned as a witch, but had somehow managed to escape the stake. The date and even the manner of her death were unknown, 
but in some vague way the secret room was supposed to be connected with it. As I speculated on these different versions of the gruesome legend, the storm increased in intensity. Rain drummed steadily against the leaded windows of the inn, and now I could occasionally hear the distant mutter of thunder. Glancing at the rain-streaked panes, I shrugged and ordered another pint of ale. I had the fresh tankard halfway to my lips when the taproom door burst open, letting in a blast of wind and rain. The door was shut and a tall figure muffled to the ears in a dripping great coat moved to the bar. Removing his cap, he ordered brandy. Having nothing better to do, I observed him closely. He looked about seventy, grizzled and weather-worn but wiry, with an appearance of toughness and determination. He was frowning, as if absorbed in thinking through some unpleasant problem. Yet his cold blue eyes inspected me keenly for a brief but deliberate interval. I could not place him in a tidy niche. He might be a local farmer. And yet I did not think that he was. He had a vague aura of authority, and though his clothes were certainly plain, they were, I thought, somewhat better in cut and quality than those of the area countrymen whom I had observed. A trivial incident opened a conversation between us. An unusually sharp crack of thunder made him turn toward the window. As he did so, he accidentally brushed his wet cap onto the floor. I retrieved it for him, he thanked me, and then we exchanged commonplace remarks about the weather. I had an intuitive feeling that, although he was a normally reticent individual, he was presently wrestling with some severe problem which made him want to hear a human voice. Realizing there was always the possibility that my intuition might have for once failed me, I nevertheless babbled on about my trip, about my genealogical researches in Kilkenny, London, and Chesterfield, and finally about my distant relationship to the Chilton Paynes, and my desire to get a good look at Chilton Castle. Suddenly I found that he was gazing at me with an expression which, if not fierce, was disturbingly intense. An awkward silence ensued. I coughed, wondering uneasily what I had said to make those cold blue eyes stare at me so fixedly. At length he became aware of my growing embarrassment. "'You must excuse me for staring,' he apologized. "'But something you said,' he hesitated. "'Could we perhaps take that table?' He nodded toward a small table which sat half in shadow in the far corner of the room. I agreed, mystified but curious, and we took our drinks to the secluded table. He sat frowning for a minute, as if uncertain how to begin. Finally, he introduced himself as William Coath. I gave him my name, and still he hesitated. At length, he took a swallow of brandy and then looked straight at me. I am, he stated, the factor at Chilton Castle. I surveyed him with surprise and renewed interest. What an agreeable coincidence, I exclaimed. Then perhaps tomorrow you could arrange for me to have a look at the castle? He seemed scarcely to hear me. "'Yes, yes, of course,' he replied absently. Puzzled and a bit irritated by his air of detachment, I remained silent. He took a deep breath and then spoke rapidly, running some of his words together. "'Robert Chilton Payne, the twelfth Earl of Chilton, was buried in the family vaults one week ago. Frederick, the young heir, and now thirteenth Earl, came of age just three days ago. Tonight it is imperative that he be conducted to the secret chamber. I gaped at him in incredulous amazement. For a moment I had an idea that he had somehow heard of my interest in Chilton Castle, and was merely pulling my leg for amusement in the belief that I was the greenest of gullible tourists. But there could be no mistaking his deadly seriousness. There was not the faintest suspicion of humor in his eyes. I groped for words. It seemed so strange, so unbelievable. Just before you arrived, I had been thinking about the various legends connected with the secret room. His cold eyes held my own. It is not legend that confronts us. It is fact. A thrill of fear and excitement ran through me. You are going there? Tonight? He nodded. Tonight. Myself, the young Earl, and one other. I stared at him. Ordinarily, he continued, the Earl himself would accompany us, 
that is the custom. But he is dead. Shortly before he passed away, he instructed me to select someone to go with the young Earl and myself. That person must be male, and preferably of the blood. I took a deep drink of ale and said not a word. He continued, Besides the young Earl, there is no one at the castle, save his elderly mother, Lady Beatrice Chilton, and an ailing aunt. Who could the Earl have had in mind? I inquired cautiously. The factor frowned. There are some distant male cousins residing in the country. I have an idea he thought at least one of them might appear for the obsequies. But not one of them did. That was most unfortunate, I observed. Extremely unfortunate. And I am therefore asking you as one of the blood to accompany the young Earl and myself to the secret room tonight. I gulped like a bumpkin. Lightning flashed against the windows, and I could hear rain swishing along the stones outside. When feathers of ice stopped fluttering in my stomach, I managed a reply. But I... that is... my relationship is so very remote. I am of the blood only by courtesy, you might say. The strain in me is so very deluded. He shrugged. You bear the name, and you possess at least a few drops of the pain blood. Under the present urgent circumstances, no more is necessary. I am sure that Earl Robert would agree with me, could he still speak. You will come? There was no escaping the intensity, the pressure, of those cold blue eyes. They seemed to follow my mind about as it groped for further excuses. Finally, inevitably it seemed, I agreed. A feeling grew in me that the meeting had become preordained, that somehow I had always been destined to visit the secret chamber in Chilton Castle. We finished our drinks, and I went up to my room for rain wear. When I descended, suitably attired for the storm, the obese bartender was snoring on his stool in spite of savage crashes of thunder, which had now become almost incessant. I envied him as I left the cozy room with William Coath. Once outside, my guide informed me that we would have to go afoot to the castle. He had purposefully walked down to the inn, he explained, in order that he might have time in solitude to straighten out in his own mind the things which he would have to do. The sheets of heavy rain, the strong wind, and the roar of thunder made conversation difficult. I walked Indian fashion behind the factor, who took enormous strides and appeared to know every inch of the way in spite of the darkness. We walked only a short distance down the village street, and then struck into a side road, which very soon dwindled to a footpath made slippery and treacherous by the driving rain. Abruptly the path began to ascend. The footing became more precarious. It was at once necessary to concentrate all one's attention on one's feet. Fortunately, the flashes of lightning were frequent. It seemed to me that we had been walking for an hour. Actually, I suppose it was only a few minutes, when the factor finally stopped. I found myself standing beside him on a flat, rocky plateau. He pointed up an incline which rose before us. Chilton Castle, he said. For a moment I saw nothing in the unrelieved darkness. Then the lightning flashed. Beyond high, battlemented walls, fissured with age, I glimpsed a great square Norman castle, with four rectangular corner towers pierced by narrow window apertures, which looked like evil, slitted eyes. The huge weathered pile was half covered by a mantle of ivy, which appeared more black than green. It looks incredibly old, I commented. William Coath nodded. It was begun in... 1122 by Henry de Montargis. Without another word, he started up the incline. As we approached the castle wall, the storm grew worse. The slanting rain and powerful wind now made speech all but impossible. We bent our heads and staggered upward. When the wall finally loomed in front of us, I was amazed at its height and thickness. It had been constructed, obviously, to withstand the best siege guns and battering rams which its early enemies could bring to bear on it. As we crossed a massive timbered drawbridge, I peered down into the black ditch of a moat, but I could not be sure whether there was water in it. 
a low arched gateway gave access through the wall to an inner cobblestone courtyard. This courtyard was entirely empty, save for rivulets of rushing water. Crossing the cobblestones with swift strides, the factor led me to another arched gateway in yet another wall. Inside was a second, smaller yard, and beyond spread the ivy-clutched base of the ancient keep itself. Traversing a darkened, stone-flagged passage, we found ourselves facing a ponderous door, age-blackened oak reinforced with pitted bands of iron. The factor flung open this door, and there before us was the great hall of the castle. Four long, hand-hewn tables with their accompanying benches stretched almost the entire length of the hall. Metal torch brackets, stained with age, were affixed to sculptured stone columns which supported the roof. Ranged around the walls were suits of armor, heraldic shields, halberds, pikes, and banners, the accumulated trophies and prizes of bloody centuries, when each castle was almost a kingdom unto itself. In flickering candlelight, which appeared to be the only illumination, the grim array was eerily impressive. William Coath waved a hand. The holders of Chilton lived by the sword for many centuries. Walking the length of the great hall, he entered another dim passageway. I followed silently. As we strode along, he spoke in a subdued voice. For Edric, the young heir, does not enjoy robust health. The shock of his father's death was severe, and he dreads tonight's ordeal, which he knows must come. Stopping before a wooden door embellished with carved fleur-de-lis and metal scrollwork, he gave me a shadowed, enigmatic glance and then knocked. Someone inquired who was there, and he identified himself. Presently, a heavy bolt was lifted and the door opened. If the Chilton Paines had been stubborn fighters in their day, the warrior blood appeared to have become considerably diluted in the veins of Frederick, the young heir now, 13th Earl. I saw before me a thin, pale-complexioned young man whose dark, sunken eyes looked haunted and fearful. His dress was both theatrical and anachronistic a dark green velvet coat and trousers, a green satin waistband, flounces of white lace at neck and wrists. He beckoned us in, as if with reluctance, and closed the door. The walls of the small room were entirely covered with tapestries depicting the hunt or medieval battle scenes. A draft of air from a window or other aperture made them undulate constantly. They seemed to have a disturbing life of their own, in one corner of the room there was an antique canopy bed. In another, a large writing table with an agate lamp. After a brief introduction, which included an explanation of how I came to be accompanying them, the factor inquired if his lordship was ready to visit the chamber. Although he was wan in any case, Earl Frederick's face now lost every trace of color. He nodded, however, and preceded us into the passage. William Coath led the way. The Earl followed him, and I brought up the rear. At the far end of the passage, the factor opened the door of a cobwebbed supply room. Here he secured candles, chisels, a pick, and a sledgehammer. After packing these into a leather bag, which he slung over one shoulder, he picked up a faggot torch, which lay on one side of the shelves in the room. He lit this, waited while it flared into a steady flame. Satisfied with this illumination, he closed the room and beckoned for us to continue after him. Nearby was a descending spiral of stone steps. Lifting his torch, the factor started down. We trailed after him wordlessly. There must have been fifty steps in that long downward spiral. As we descended, the stones became wet and cold. The air, too, grew colder, but the cold was not of the type that refreshes. It was too laden with the smell of mold and dampness. At the bottom of the steps we faced a tunnel, pitch black and silent. The factor raised his torch. Chelton Castle is Norman, but is said to have been reared over a Saxon ruin. It is believed that the passageways in these depths were constructed by the Saxons. He peered, frowning, into the tunnel, or by some still earlier folk. He hesitated briefly, and I thought he was listening. Then, glancing round at us, he proceeded down the passage 
I walked after the Earl, shivering. The dead, icy air seemed to pierce to the pith of my bones. The stones underfoot grew slick with a film of slime. I longed for more light, but there was none save that cast by the flickering, bobbing torch of the factor. Part way down the passage he paused, and again I sensed that he was listening. The silence seemed absolute, however, and we went on. The end of the passage brought us to more descending steps. We went down some fifteen and entered another tunnel, which appeared to have been cut out of the solid rock on which the castle had been reared. White-crusted nitre clung to the walls. The reek of mold was intense. The icy air was fetid with some other odor, which I found peculiarly repellent, though I could not name it. At last the factor stopped, lifted his torch, and slid the leather bag from his shoulder. I saw that we stood before a wall made of some kind of building stone. Though damp and stained with nitre, it was obviously of much more recent construction than anything we had previously encountered. Glancing round at us, William Coath handed me the torch. Keep a good hold on it, if you please. I have candles, but... Leaving the sentence unfinished, he drew the pick from his sling bag and began an assault on the wall. The barrier was solid enough, but after he had worked a hole in it, he took up the sledgehammer and quicker progress was made. Once I offered to take up the sledge while he held the torch, but he only shook his head and went on with his work of demolition. All this time the young earl had not spoken a word. As I looked at his tense white face, I felt sorry for him, in spite of my own mounting trepidation. Abruptly there was silence as the factor lowered the sledgehammer. I saw that a good two feet of the lower wall remained. William Coath bent to inspect it. Strong enough, he commented cryptically. I will leave that to build on. We can step over it. For a full minute he stood looking silently into the blackness beyond. Finally, shouldering his bag, he took the torch from my hand and stepped over the ragged base of the wall. We followed suit. As I entered that chamber, the fetid odor which I had noticed in the passage seemed to overwhelm us. It washed around us in a nauseating wave, and we all gasped for breath. The factor spoke between coughs. It will subside in a minute or two. Stand near the aperture. Although the reek remained repellently strong, we could at length breathe more freely. William Coath lifted his torch and peered into the black depths of the chamber. Fearfully, I gazed around his shoulder. There was no sound and at first I could see nothing but nitre, encrusted walls and wet stone floor. Presently, however, in a far corner, just beyond the flickering halo of the faggot torch, I saw two tiny, fiery spots of red. I tried to convince myself that they were two red jewels, two rubies shining in the torchlight. But I knew at once, I felt at once, what they were. They were two red eyes, and they were watching us with a fierce, unwavering stare. The factor spoke softly. Wait here. He crossed toward the corner, stopped halfway, and held out his torch at arm's length. For a moment he was silent. Finally, he emitted a long, shuddering sigh. When he spoke again, his voice had changed. It was only a sepulchral whisper. Come forward, he told us in that strange hollow voice. I followed Earl Frederick until we stood at either side of the factor. When I saw what was crouched on a stone bench in that far corner, I felt sure that I would faint. My heart literally stopped beating for perceptible seconds. The blood left my extremities. I reeled with dizziness. I might have cried out, but my throat would not open. The entity which rested on that stone bench was like something that had crawled up out of hell. Piercing, malignant red eyes proclaimed that it had a terrible life. And yet that life sustained itself in a black, shrunken, half-mummified body, which resembled a disinterred corpse.
A few moldy rags clung to the cadaver-like frame. Wisps of white hair sprouted out of its ghastly gray-white skull. A red smear or blotch of some sort covered the wizened slit which served it as a mouth. It surveyed us with a malignancy which was beyond anything merely human. It was impossible to stare back into those monstrous red eyes. They were so inexpressibly evil. One felt that one's soul would be consumed in the fires of their malevolence. Glancing aside, I saw that the factor was now supporting Earl Frederick. The young heir had sagged against him. The Earl stared fixedly at the fearful apparition with terror-glazed eyes. In spite of my own sense of horror, I pitied him. The factor sighed again, and then he spoke once more in that low, sepulchral voice. "'You see before you,' he told us, "'Lady Susan Glanville. She was carried into this chamber and fettered to the wall in 1473.' A thrill of horror coursed through me. I felt that we were in the presence of malign forces from the pit itself. To me the hideous thing had appeared sexless, but at the sound of its name— the ghastly mockery of a grin contorted the puckered, red-smeared mouth. I noticed now for the first time that monster actually was secured to the wall. The great double shackles were so blackened with age I had not noticed them before. The factor went on as if he spoke by rote. Lady Glanville was a maternal ancestor of the Chilton Pains. She had commerce with the devil. She was condemned as a witch but escaped the stake. Finally, her own people forcibly overcame her. She was brought in here, fettered, and left to die. He was silent a moment and then continued. It was too late. She had already made a pact with the powers of darkness. It was an unspeakably evil thing, and it has consumed her issue to a life of torment and nightmare, a lifetime of terror and dread. He swung his torch toward the blackened, red-eyed thing, she was a beauty once. She hated death. She feared death. And so she finally bartered her own immortal soul and the bodies of her issue for eternal earthly life. I heard his voices in a nightmare. It seemed to be coming from an infinite distance. He went on. The consequences of breaking the pact are too terrible to describe. No descendant of hers has ever dared do so, once the forfeit is known. And so she has bided here for these nearly five hundred years. I had thought he was finished, but he resumed. Glancing upward, he lifted his torch toward the roof of that accursed chamber. Thus room, he said, lies directly underneath the family vaults. Upon the death of the male earl, the body is ostensibly left in the vaults. When the mourners have gone, however, the false bottom of the vault is thrust aside, and the body of the earl is lowered into this room. Looking up, I saw the square rectangle of a trapdoor above. The factor's voice now became barely audible. Once every generation, Lady Glanville feeds on the corpse of the deceased earl. It is a provision of that unspeakable pact which cannot be broken. I knew now, with a sense of horror, utterly beyond description, whence came that red smear on the repulsive mouth of the creature before us. As if to confirm his words, the factor lowered his torch until its flame illuminated the floor at the foot of the stone bench, where the vampiric monster was fettered. Strewn about the floor were the scattered bones and skull of an adult male, red with fresh blood, and at some distance were other human bones, brown and crumbling with age. At this point, young Earl Frederick began to scream. His shrill, hysterical cries filled the chamber. Although the factor shook him roughly, his terrible shrieks continued, terror-filled, nerve-shaking. For moments, the corpse-like thing on the bench watched him with its frightful red eyes. It uttered sound finally, a kind of animal squeal which might have been intended as laughter. Abruptly then, and without any warning, it slid from the bench and lunged toward the young earl. 
The blackened shackles which fettered it to the wall permitted it to advance only a yard or two. It was pulled back sharply, yet it lunged again and again, squealing with a kind of hellish glee which stirred the hair on my head. William Kowath thrust his torch toward the monster, but it continued to lunge at the end of its fetters. The nightmare room resounded with the Earl's screams and the creature's horrible squeals of bestial laughter. I felt that my own mind would give way unless I escaped from that anteroom of hell. For the first time during an ordeal which would have sent any lesser man fleeing for his life and sanity, the iron control of the factor appeared to be shaken. He looked beyond the wild lunging thing toward the wall where the fetters were fastened. I sensed what was in his mind. Would those fastenings hold after all these centuries of rust and dampness? On a sudden resolve, he reached into an inner pocket and drew out something which glittered in the torchlight. It was a silver crucifix. Striding forward, he thrust it almost into the twisted face of the leaping monstrosity, which had once been the ravishing Lady Susan Glanville. The creature reeled back with an agonized scream which drowned out the cries of the Earl. It cowered on the bench, abruptly silent and motionless. Only the pulsating of its wizened mouth and the fires of hatred in its red eyes giving evidence that it still lived. William Kawath addressed it grimly. Creature of hell, if ye leave that bench ere we quit this room and seal it once again, I swear that I shall hold this cross against ye. The thing's red eyes watched the factor with an expression of abysmal hatred which no combination of mere letters could convey. They actually appeared to glow with fire. And yet I read in them something else. Fear. I suddenly became aware that silence had descended on that room of the damned. It lasted only a few moments. The Earl finally stopped screaming. But now came something worse. He began to laugh. It was only a low chuckle, but it was somehow worse than all his screams. It went on and on, softly, mindlessly. The factor turned, beckoning me toward the partially demolished wall. Crossing the room, I climbed out. Behind me, the factor led the young Earl, who shuffled like an old man, chuckling to himself. There was then what seemed an interminable interval, during which the factor carried back a sack of mortar and a keg of water, which he had previously left somewhere in the tunnel. Working by torchlight, he prepared the cement and proceeded to seal up the chamber, using the same stones which he had displaced. While the factor labored, the young earl sat motionless in the tunnel, chuckling softly. There was silence from within. Once only I heard the thing's fetters clank against the stone. At last the factor finished and led us back through those nitre-stained passageways and up the icy stairs. The earl could scarcely ascend. With difficulty the factor supported him from step to step. Back in his tapestry-paneled chamber, Earl Frederick sat on his canopy bed and stared at the floor, laughing quietly. Pompous medical tomes to the contrary, I noticed that his black hair had actually turned gray. After persuading him to drink a glass of liquid which I had no doubt contained a heavy dose of sedation, the factor managed to get him stretched out on the bed. William Kowath then led me to a nearby bedchamber. My impulse was to rush from that hellish pile without delay, but the storm still raged and I was by no means sure I could find my way back to the village without a guide. The factor shook his head sadly. I fear his lordship is doomed to an early death. He was never strong and tonight's events may have deranged his mind. May have weakened him beyond hope of recovery. I expressed my sympathy and horror. The factor's cold blue eyes held my own. It may be, he said, that in the event of the young earl's death, you yourself might be considered. He hesitated. Might be considered, he finally concluded, as one somewhat in the line of secession. I wanted to hear no more. I gave him a curt good night, bolted the door after him, and tried, quite unsuccessfully, 
to salvage a few minutes' sleep. But sleep would not come. I had feverish visions of that red-eyed thing in the sealed chamber escaping its fetters, breaking through the wall, and crawling up those icy, slime-covered stairs. Even before dawn, I softly unbolted my door, and like a marauding thief, crept shivering through the cold passageways and the great deserted hall of the castle. Crossing the cobbled courtyards and the black moat, I scrambled down the incline toward the village. Long before noon, I was well on my way to London. Luck was with me. The next day I was on a liner bound for the Atlantic run. I shall never return to England. I intend always to keep Chilton Castle and its permanent occupant at least an ocean away. End of section one. The horror at Chilton Castle.